Thank you very much. Here at the Athelton Church, we are happy to let you know that we have a very active prayer ministries, a prayer ministries that is pushing us into connecting with each other through prayer and in prayer with God. And they have a creative name. It is PUSH. Pray until something happens. And that's exactly what we are doing. Prayer Ministries wants to let you know that we are beginning a week, beginning in the month of February, a week of prayer and fasting that will involve different times for prayer, connecting with others, being able to share your requests. Tomorrow, Sunday at 7.30, there will be a time of prayer, and there will be a devotional time up front that will be by Pastor Sean Paris. Some of you may be familiar with him. And so, how do we get this link? How do we join this prayer? Well, email Phoebe Roberts. Fabian Roberts is our prayer ministries coordinator now. Email her at the email on your screen to obtain the link if you haven't already done so. In every good relationship, there is something honorable about confirming in someone that which they may already know. There comes a time, even in the best of relationships, that reinforcing something that is already understood, even in new ways, is important. That is why employers or supervisors would do well to affirm their workers every now and then about how good they are doing. Husbands, they would do well to repeat their love for their wives and wives for their husbands. Every night, Denny and I will say to each other before we go to sleep, I love you, even if we've had an argument earlier that day. And to be honest, even if I wasn't even feeling it. Why? Because the principle of love far exceeds the vacillating feelings. And so it's always good to affirm that. Parents, to repeat that, their love to their kids, I'm proud of you. I'm so happy to be your daddy. And children, if we still have our parents, it would be honorable to remind them as well about how important they are. There's a preacher who once said, his name John Renhifo, who said, we often take for granted those whom we couldn't do without. God exercises such qualities with his children. And he exercises that quality specifically with his son. And we're going to see that that was exercised in a gift that the, that the father gave to his son. It was a gift that was really for our benefit today. Now, everybody likes gifts, don't you? I like receiving gifts every now and then. I have a gift for you. Oh, wow. And it just couldn't wait, so there you go. <laughs> How special. Thank you, Julia. Oh, you're welcome. It's so special that I'm going to have to set it aside. Thank you so much. Wow, it, it looks great. It's a great gift. We begin our study today with an incredible experience on the mountain. God is going to do something for His Son that no human eye has ever seen, and that which we will only see when Jesus comes again. We pick up the story upon a rugged path atop a mountainside. Jesus and His three closest disciples are weary from the climb. Yes, the Son of God, encompassed by the limitations of humanity, was weary. It is evening, and the setting sun has faded now behind the mountain. Jesus and his three closest disciples. Why? Why only Peter, James, and John? Because only these three would be chosen to witness his anguish in Gethsemane. And so, there was a certain heaviness about them. And Jesus knew it. Because just days before, Jesus had predicted his death. 
that He would suffer many things at the hands of the chief priests and the elders. And said one author that the gloom of their surroundings seems to be in harmony with the sorrow in their own hearts. And so this morning we pick up our story in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 17. Would you please take your Bible there where you are at home. I know some, sometimes you may be preparing lunch and listening to the sermon. Kids are doing something else. But wherever you are, pause and pick up your Bible. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, the first book in the New Testament. And we look at this story of something incredible that the Father did for His Son. A confirmation that the Father had in honor of His Son for the benefit of those who were witnessing. Matthew chapter 17, we're going to read the first three verses here at first. We'll put it for you on the screen. It says, after six days, Jesus took with Him Peter and James and John, His brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And He was transfigured before them, and His face shone like the sun, and His clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with Him. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. Here we have, in, this is verse 5, Jumping to verse 5, what we see is the very presence of Christ was transfigured before Peter, James, and John. Jesus had taken His disciples up this high mountain. They were weary. It was getting dark. But Jesus knew that there was a certain heaviness because He had predicted that He would depart from them. And even though they didn't fully quite understand what Jesus was referring to, they suspected that there would be something ominous. And so Jesus knew that His disciples would need a confirmation of His divinity to prepare them, to buoy their faith for the hour of darkness. And my friends, the Bible tells us that there was this radiance that just covered Jesus. This splendor, this luminosity that covered Jesus, and there as the disciples are praying as they see their Lord praying, this brightness, is it was so vast and so intense that they fell to their faces. The Bible records that the disciples recognize these two messengers who came to Jesus. Now this is beautiful here. These two messengers were not angels. They were Moses and Elijah. And so you can picture that the disciples are they're, they're trying to make sense. Jesus' own body was illuminated with the glory of heaven. His own divinity flashed. And the Bible records that the transfiguration came in two ways. One, His face shined like the sun. And the second, that His raiment or His clothes became white as light. Now, it wasn't so much that his clothes became white. It was that his body was so radiant that his clothing couldn't contain it. And the disciples were just like trying to fixate their eyes on Jesus, but it was so bright. And they could make out Moses and Elijah. Jesus appears in his splendor, and Moses and Elijah appears to the Lord. Why Moses and Elijah? They were men who had endured sorrow and thus could sympathize with Jesus in the trial of his earthly life. This was a, a, an incredible moment where the father wanted to confirm in his son that he was truly God's beloved. And because of that confirmation, it would bring strength to the disciples. 
And so the, the Father here lets the flash of divinity, this veil of humanity is pulled aside, and for a moment the disciples could see Jesus in His full glory. The disciples are flooded with the illumination on the mount that they are able to endure, yet they're able to endure the wondrous light, but they see that Jesus is not alone. Moses and Elijah. And what do they do? They come, and the Bible says that they commune with Jesus. And this wasn't a conversation about his coming as king, but it was a conversation that said, hey, you can do it. The cross is before you, Jesus, and a whole universe is counting on you. What was the purpose of this transfiguration? Well, it is twofold. Number one, it was to strengthen Christ and to encourage Him on the road to the cross. But the second was to lift the disciples' faith and to assure them in their hour of darkness that this was indeed and is indeed the divine Son of God, Moses and Elijah. What do we know about Moses? Moses was the one on the mount who had, in, in his final moments, had been allowed to see, atop Mount Pisgah, had been allowed to see the promised land that God would bring to his people and deliver to his people. And even though he wasn't able to enter in, God in his mercy allowed Moses to see it. Moses died by himself atop that mountain, and the Lord himself was his undertaker. But it was Moses who at one point in his life had actually requested to see the Lord's glory. It says in Exodus 33 and verse 18, Moses pleading and saying, please show me your glory. To which God had answered, you will only be able to see my backside. And here Moses is on the Mount of Transfiguration, enveloped in the glory that covered the Son of God. What do we know about Elijah? Well, Elijah was one who stood on Mount Carmel all by himself. Elijah, who for three and a half years of famine had borne the hatred of the nation, who fled to the desert in anguish and despair. And beloved, these two men were often in their solitude praying for the salvation of their country that they loved so much. And that's why God brought these messengers, not angels, but Moses and Elijah. The transfiguration, one more point, the transfiguration was a scene in miniature of the glory of the second coming of Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible tells us that Moses and Elijah were there, that Christ radiated in His glory, and it will be again when Jesus comes again. When Jesus comes, my friends, Moses would represent those living saints who would be raised back to life. And Elijah would represent that company who would be translated without seeing death. And these two are there in microscopic significance, a picture of the glory of the second coming. Even these loved disciples needed this confirmation. You see, it is honorable. God did something honorable for His Son to affirm His divinity, even though Jesus knew where He stood with God, but He did it in benefit of the disciples who would be strengthened in their faith. The disciples needed this. And you know what? I think that we today need a special manifestation of God's presence. Even these loved disciples who were self-absorbed, absorbed in their own doubts, in their own ambitious hopes, they had to learn that before the crown must come the cross. And today we are in need of that more than ever. In our time where we have, for the most part, been apart from each other, where we have been enveloped with the mood and the morale of the world, the people of God need a special manifestation of God Himself. 
We are as confused a culture as I have seen in my 40-something years of life. There are no answers out there. We have become the focal point of our own existence. But such is human nature that we, like the disciples who even to the very end understood Jesus to mean that He would set up an earthly kingdom and that they were kind of vying to see who would be the next in line. We are not much different than they. There are two great soccer players in our time, as there are many others, uh, but these two have been at each other about who is the best. One is Lionel Messi of Argentina. The other is Cristiano Ronaldo of Portugal. There has been discussion about these two, about who's number one and number two in the soccer world. Ronaldo was being interviewed by the media, and he made the comment once that he believed that God had sent him into the world to show people how soccer ought to be played. Another interviewer went to Lionel Messi and asked him, so this is how they antagonize. So they said, what do you think of Ronaldo's statement that God sent him into the world to show people how to play soccer? He paused a bit, and Messi said, I honestly don't remember sending him. <laughs> Beloved, we have this extraordinary opinion of how great we are. Like the disciples, we are rich and increased with goods and believe that we have need of nothing. And here, in an incredible feat, the Father would confirm to these disciples that what they were going to go through would be validated by the glory of the Son at that Mount of Transfiguration. And God says, at the expense of my Son, I will lavish this gift upon you, though you've done nothing to deserve it. The transfiguration was only part of the preparation of that which Jesus really wanted to gift his disciples with. And what was that? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Julia, I want to thank you for this gift. What if I tell Julia, wow, you know, this is great. I, I love it. Thank you so much. But what would really mean a lot to her is if I opened it, right? Much the same, we have done this with the gift that God has given us. We've been wowed by it. We have been seemingly appreciative of it. But we have yet to actually acknowledge and to receive it in its fullness. And God has lavished upon His church the Holy Spirit. The transfiguration, as I said, was only part of the preparation for what would be truly the gift. You see, my friends, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was in like what the transfiguration was on top of that mountain. The transfiguration honored the Son's request in preparation for Calvary. But there would be another confirmation of the Son in honor and vindication of the completed sacrificial mission, which was His life. And that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Without Calvary, Pentecost would never have occurred. And without Pentecost, Calvary would not have mattered. Just as the transfiguration on the mount was heaven's confirmation of the splendor and majesty of Jesus, so the Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's confirmation that the Redeemer's work was accomplished and accepted. Many years later, Peter, who witnessed the transfiguration, wrote from his prison cell these words. Notice what it says in 1 Peter 1.16, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. And Peter goes on to describe that what they witnessed there was not only the Lord in His glory, but Peter describes this is also 
we heard him. By the way, that should be 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Our PBE team would be familiar with this passage. And it goes to say in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you heed, or you take heed, as unto a light that shines in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Here is Peter, an old man. He knows that his fate is about to be sealed by his own blood. He knows. And here Peter writes to encourage the believers throughout time. He says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it. We heard the voice that came from the cloud. One translation said that there was a voice that came both from nowhere and from everywhere because they didn't know where it came from. We heard that voice. We saw his glory. We were eyewitnesses to his majesty. And Peter says, even though we saw it, yet we still have a more sure word of prophecy. What does that mean, Peter? He says, even though I saw this with my own eyes, we can place more confidence in the written word that the Spirit has inspired. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Jesus said to his disciples that it was expedient for them that he go away. Why would it be expedient? Because Jesus knew that unless he goes away, the Holy Spirit could not be poured out upon his church. And beloved, that is the gift that God has given to us. Jesus says, I will come to you. That's why at Pentecost, the disciples knew they could approach the work before them with such conviction because Jesus was with them in the person of the Spirit. The illumination of Pentecost came in three ways for the disciples. Number one, that the truths that they could not understand while Christ was with them was now unfolded to them. The second illumination was that they were filled with a faith and assurance that they had never had before. They had this confidence that carried with it a conviction that God was with them. And the third thing that Pentecost brought to them was that their hearts were filled with a love. A love so deep, so far, so full, that they had an intense longing to carry forward the work that Jesus had begun. This is what they were filled and illuminated with at Pentecost. Pentecost was God's gift to His church. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that gift which Peter had said to the people who were cut to the heart, he says, repent and be baptized in Acts chapter 2. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins and God will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. There were two major shifts in the Hebrew thinking. Two major shifts that would not have been possible without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I mean, think of this. A major shift in Hebrew thinking. The one was that Jesus Christ was the promised Messiah. That was a huge major shift in the Hebrew mind. The second major shift was that salvation was for the Gentile just as much as for the Jew. Both of these would only be possible through the Holy Spirit. You know, atop the Mount of Transfiguration, we're told that when Jesus finally had, was left alone, when Elijah and Moses had departed and the glory, the apparent visible glory had left. The disciples were still down, prostrated to the ground. And the Bible records that God, in the form of His Son, comes and He touches them. 
Here, these disciples who had been blinded by the light, by the glory and the splendor and the luminosity that filled the Son of God, here they were, and a hand touches them. And they looked up, and the Bible records that they saw no one except for Jesus. He was their vision. There was no one there save Jesus. When the light had departed, when everything had left, it was Jesus and them alone. You see, Jesus had become their only vision. The 20th of January this year, we saw the inauguration of the new president. And after all of the political speeches and everything that was done and said, finally, then came the poet. And while all eyes around the globe were on this young lady who came up to the podium, with conviction and with the eloquence of poetry, she recited some of the most beautiful things and powerful truths at that time that I had heard, certainly a highlight of that day. And I'd like to read to you just a few of the words of that potent, packed poem that this young lady had read, not only before those present, but before the eyes of the watching globe. She says, Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together, victorious. And then she ends it, as she brings it to a climactic end, she says this at last, when day comes, we step out of the shade aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. After all of the political speeches and everything was done, then came the poet. And the poet brought light to the hour of our day, brought a perspective that we needed to hear. My dear friends, God says to you and to me that at the expense of my son, I have lavished this gift upon you, even though you've done nothing to deserve it. When the disciples rose, all they could see was Jesus. Today we need, as a church of God, in this day, a new manifestation of the glory of God. When it seems that Jesus is not active in his church, then you can expect something extraordinary to take place. Listen here, watching from home. Never lose sight of the fact that what we are seeing take place in our world today is the outcrop of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. If we lose that perspective, you will become fixated on what you see and what you hear, and it will change you. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And in a vastly changed world, we have very few certainties, especially today. But the certainties that we do have, I am more certain of today than at any other time in my life of God's presence with us, of his love and of his comfort, and that Jesus is coming again. And so don't let yourself get wrapped up in what do I see, what do I feel, what do I think. No, it's what do I know. What do I know? And this I know, 
that Jesus is still guiding his people and he is with you today and he is providing for you and strengthening you, dwelling in you through the Holy Spirit. Let that be your prayer today. Be thou, Lord, my vision. Be thou my vision.